we're going to talk about Easter, the Easter story and what really happened. You know, when we talk about Christmas, most of us are probably uh, well-versed enough to realize that most of what we know about Christmas is, are pagan legends, and uh, that's pretty familiar ground. But it may surprise many of us to discover that what we have been taught about Easter is also uh, full of misconceptions. And I'm not talking about the pagan name Easter. Obviously, the original Easter comes from the worship of Ishtar, Astarte, it, uh, pagan rituals about the time of the uh, vernal equinox, the, the spring uh, equinox. But we use the term uh, throughout our culture really to refer to the Christian holidays that derive really from the Jewish Passover. And uh, it's astonishing to discover that even within the Christian context of using, aside from the label Easter, much of what we think we have been know or what we've been taught about Easter is our misconceptions, some of them very deliberate misconceptions. So we're going to explore the Easter story. And in part one, we'll get the background and we'll explore some of these myths and misconceptions that plague us about the Easter story. What really happened? We're going to talk a little bit about the myths and misconceptions, as setting a background for our second session where we'll go into the Easter story itself, what happened that Sunday morning. First of all, let's talk a little bit about the reality. You know, one of the things that uh, are shortcomings of Mel Gibson's famous movie, The Passion, uh, it was in many ways quite an uh, interesting project, it has a few Catholic overtones, but all in all, a, a very notable piece of work. However, it has two major shortcomings. The first is that it creates the impression that the crucifixion was a tragedy, when in fact it was an achievement. The specifications were laid down before the foundation of the world. It was a, a, a climax of a mission that Jesus came on this earth to fulfill. The second shortcoming of the movie is it doesn't get across who he re really is. And uh, it to fail to identify the fact that we have the Creator Himself become incarnate to fulfill a mission on our behalf. Those are two critical issues that we have to confront, especially around the Easter time. But there's a second aspect of the Easter story that may surprise you, and that is a deliberate um, separation by the church from the biblical text. And there is a strange word called the quattrodecimans, and we want to understand what quattrodeciman is. The term comes from the Latin. It means 14-ism. And it's a term that was applied to Christians that insisted upon celebrating in accordance with the biblical text. The 14th day of Nisan is on the Jewish calendar, Passover, and it's three days after that that the resurrection took place. And there were Christians in the early church, 1st, 2nd, 3rd century, that insisted upon following that practice. Interestingly enough, and they, they uh, were labeled in these controversies that emerged as the quattrodecimans. This was the, uh, they clung to the Torah, the uh, date of Passover, uh, which was intended, expressed in the book of Exodus, to be a perpetual ordinance. And they were uh, set upon observing them. Even as early as the second century, we discover there are tensions brewing in the church. Now, the Roman church celebrated Passover on Sunday, um, at least since the time of Bishop Zixus or Sextus I. This is recorded by Eusebius. In 154 AD, Polycarp visited Rome to settle disputes about this issue. And uh, even Irenaeus wrote about it in support of the Quattrodecimans uh, in the second century. However, in the third century, the Council of Nicaea, most of us are aware of that pivotal council, it unanimously ruled that Easter festival should be celebrated throughout the Christian world on the first Sunday after the full moon following the vernal equinox. And that if the full moon should occur on a Sunday and thereby coincide with the Passover festival, Easter should be commemorated on the following Sunday, deliberately trying to worship on a day other than the uh, biblical account. And as a result of the Council of Nicaea, they, and amended by numerous subsequent councils, 
The formal church desperately attempted to design a formula for Easter, as they called it, which would avoid any possibility of falling on the Jewish Passover, even accidentally. In fact, the quatrudecimans, as they were called, were excommunicated. And that is actually astonishing in terms of the uh, implications um, for the church. Those that were biblical were outcast. And the motives were very clear. In uh, Eusebius' life of Constantine, he quotes Constantine as follows. It appeared an unworthy thing that the celebration of this most holy feast, that we should follow the practice of the Jews who have impiously defiled their hands with enormous sin and are therefore deservedly afflicted with the blindness of soul. Let us then have nothing in common with the detestable Jewish crowd, for we have received from our Savior a different way. Recognize that it was anti-Semitism in the early church that caused the church to lead the congregations away from the biblical text. In ecclesiastical history, he quotes the epistle of Emperor Constantine himself in his own words as follows. It was in the first place declared improper to follow the custom of the Jews in the celebration of this holy festival because their hands having been stained with crime, the minds of these wretched men are necessarily blinded. Let us then have nothing in common with the Jews who are our adversaries, avoiding all contact with that evil way. And he continues, who after having compassed the death of the Lord, being out of their minds, are guided not by sound re reason, but by an unrestrained passion, whatever their innate madness carries them, a people so utterly depraved. Therefore, this irregularity must be corrected in order that we may ha no more have anything in common with those parasites and the murderers of our Lord, no single point in common with the perjury of the Jews. Shocking language. Shocking language. But to realize that the early church was so anti-Semitic that they altered their practices away from the biblical text and ushered in all kinds of confusion. That confusion still reigns today. They were under the Julian calendar, which um, had an astronomical problem, a discrepancy between the solar year and the lunar year, which of course drives the Jewish calendar. There were had numerous alternatives for fixing the date of the feast, were tried by the church, but proved unsatisfactory. So the Easter was celebrated in different dates throughout the Christian world. For example, in 387, the dates of Easter in France and Egypt were separated by 35 days. So utter confusion is reigning and it gets worse. About 465, the church adopted a system of calculation proposed by the astronomer Victorianus to reform the calendar and fix the date of Easter. Some of his methods are still in use, although the Scythian monk by the name of Diocinus Exodus made significant adjustments to the Easter cycle in the 6th century. Refusal by the British and Celtic Christian churches to adopt the proposed changes led to a bitter dispute between them and Rome in the 7th century. So it continues. Finally, the Julian calendar gets reformed in 1582 to, in what they called the Gregorian Reform, and that eliminated some of the difficulties in fixing the date of Easter and arranging the ecclesiastical year, but that was not accepted for two centuries by the British, uh, Great Britain and uh, Ireland, and so Easter was celebrated on the same day in the Western after 1752, but it doesn't, sol it doesn't solve all the problems. The Eastern churches never did adopt the Gregorian calendar, and they commemorate Easter on a Sunday, either preceding or following the date observed in the West. And uh, occasionally the dates coincide by coincidence in 1865 and 1963. In 1928, the, the British Parliament enacted a measure allowing the Church of England to commemorate Easter on the first Sunday after the second Saturday in April. All these formulas designed to avoid encountering the Jewish Passover, which of course is what it's all about. And so, despite all these steps, the confusion continues, and Easter is labeled in most encyclopedias as a movable feast to hide this confusion. So, that's the Contradecimans controversy. We understand, if you understand the Bible, Jesus crucified on Passover. We need to understand when Passover is. It's very explicit in the biblical text. And, of course, the, and the resurrection three days. Well, that leads to another issue. Did it occur on a Friday or a Wednesday? We speak of Good Friday. That's a church tradition. And there are many good scholars that still defend it a Friday. But let's talk about that a little bit. There are at least three reasons that many serious scholars of the Scriptures believe it could not have been on a Friday. Very likely it was a Wednesday. For three reasons. In Matthew 12, verse 40, it indicates uh, Jesus himself, in his own words, said there would be three days and three nights. 
that he would be in the, in the belly of the earth. And uh, there, it's hard to get three days and three nights between a Friday and a Sunday. And there are many amusing anecdotes I could incorporate, but we're tight for time, so I'll spare you those. But moving on. In John chapter 12, first verse, it indicates that Jesus traveled from Jericho to Bethany six days before Passover. That tells us that Passover could not have been on a Friday because that would have made Jesus travel more than a Sabbath day's journey. It's almost 20 miles from, from Jericho to Bethany. That's a clue that Passover was not on a Friday. But also, Matthew, most of the confusion occurs because of mistranslation of the first verse of Matthew 28. It's when the Sabbaths were passed. That's a plural term in the Greek. There are, there are more than one Sabbath between Passover and that Sunday morning. And uh, there, most people don't realize that Shabbat is the seventh day of the week, but there are also seven high Sabbaths throughout the year, one of which is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which occurred between Passover and that Sunday morning. So that's another indication that the crucifixion could not happen on a Friday. It really derives from a misunderstanding of the translation of Matthew 28.1. But... Uh, so let's take a look at the final week. Friday, he's at Bethany. Saturday is the triumphal entry that we talk about. This is by one reckoning. There are many good scholars of slightly different reckonings. Sunday, the fig tree is cursed. Monday, the conspirators council. Tuesday night is the Last Supper or the Last Seder. And he's crucified between the evenings. Bear in mind that Passover starts at sundown on Tuesday and goes till sundown on Wednesday. And he's crucified, in effect, Wednesday afternoon by this reckoning, if it's correct. And we have the crucifixion on a Wednesday, the Feast of Unleavened Bread the following day. The women prepare the spices on Friday, and of course, they rest on Shabbat. And it's after the Sabbaths, plural, that Matthew talks about, that we have, of course, the Sunday discovery of the empty tomb. Uh, rabbis would say that he actually was resurrected Saturday night, as we would call it, but discovered, of course, Sunday morning, whatever. In any case, there's a couple of other issues to be aware of as we get into the details, who is calling the shots? It's not his uh, adversaries. They had not planned to do this on a feast day for fear of the Romans. Why did they do it? Because Jesus forced them to. At the Last Supper, he announces he's going to be betrayed. That puts Judas on the spot. He's got a fisher, a cut bait, as we call it. So he, who is calling the shots? Jesus himself is calling the shots. There is another issue that we should talk about, and that's the manner of death. Satan's strategy would have been to get a what they call in the Torah a righteous death. That means he should have been killed by stoning, as far as Satan would have preferred. But contrary to that, he is obviously crucified. A form of execution that had not been invented, but for about 60 years prior, it was prophesied over 700 years earlier in the scripture. And we'll take a look at that. And the way we'll look at some of these things is to take a quick snapshot, as best we can with the time we have, to talk about the prelude to the resurrection, obviously, including the Last Supper. We'll touch on the Upper Room Discourse, what happened in Gethsemane, the arrest, and so forth. Six trials that we'll summarize, and then, of course, the crucifixion itself that I'm sure we're familiar with. To look at the final week carefully, you really should take the time to compare the accounts that are in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They all comment on aspects, and they all include some things the others miss. And, of course, that final week starts with the triumphal entry, which we find recorded in Matthew 21, Mark 11, Luke 19, and John 12. Very crucial material. I assume it's familiar to most of you if you've done your homework on Daniel chapter 9 and so forth. So that whole area, I encourage you to study if it's not familiar to you. But obviously we go from there to what's called the Olivet Discourse, which occurs in Matthew 24 and Mark 13. It's a misunderstanding to assume that Luke 21 is the Olivet Discourse. It's a very similar but different presentation to a different audience with different uh, emphasis, but that's a whole study to take, undertake on your own. That brings us to the part that we'll start looking at more closely, the events that start with the Last Seder, the Last Supper, as we would call it, uh, but it was a, a Seder as far as the Jews concerned, a Passover Seder. And that's recorded in Matthew 26, and we'll use that as our backbone, but we'll pick up a few 
insights from Mark 14 and Luke 22, and certainly from John 13 to 18. John doesn't talk much about, the, uh, he doesn't cover the same ground as Matthew, Mark, and Luke does, but he includes a discourse that you need to study carefully because he gives us profound insights, and, and the true prayer, the prayer between him and the Father, that deserves very careful study. And from there we'll go to the crucifixion itself, which are the following chapters in each case, and that will set the stage for part two where we'll deal with the resurrection in the next session. Matthew 26 predicts the suffering and death. He's anointed at Bethany. Jude betrays him. There's the Passover meal during which the, the, the Lord's Supper is, is instituted. And uh, then they go to the Garden of Gethsemane where they, there's prayer and the arrest. And he's, and he's, he's accused. And then there's the denial of Peter. That, Matthew 26 is a primary chronicle here. Let's just take a look at it. It came to pass when Jesus had finished all these things. He said unto his disciples, You know that after two days, the feast of the Passover, the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. And they then assembled together the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders of the people unto the palace of the high priest who was called Caiaphas. Caiaphas was the Jewish appointee. The Jews really honored Annas. Annas was not official, but the one the Jews looked to. Caiaphas had the, the franchise from the Romans. But anyway, notice verse, uh, uh, the next verse, uh, uh, verse 4 and 5. They consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. That was the plan. But notice this. And they said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. That would bring the Romans on their neck, and they didn't want to have that happen. So it was not their plan to do this on any feast day. And we're facing the most uh, uh, serious, the most popular, the most com one of the three compulsory feasts of the year, Passover. That was not the plan, but Jesus is calling the shots, not them, interestingly enough. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said unto them, What will you give me? And I will deliver them unto you. They covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver. And from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. He wasn't planning to do it. Jesus forced him to fish or cut bait at the Lord's Last Supper. Zechariah 11 predicts all this, interestingly enough. In Zechariah 11, some five centuries earlier, is written, I said unto them, If you think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. And then there's an interesting prophecy. The Lord said unto me, cast it under the potter, a goodly price that I was prized out of them. And I took the, and Zechariah says, I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. Very, one of these interesting enigmas tucked away in the book of Zechariah. Passover, of course, was predicted way, way back in the Akedah in Genesis 22, where Abram's offering Isaac. God will provide himself a lamb. Abraham knew he was acting out prophecy. He named the place that way. John introduces, John the Baptist introduces Jesus Christ publicly when the whole ministry starts twice. He says, Behold the lamb that taketh away the sin of the world. That's a Jewish title. Jesus Christ's destiny was to be a lamb offered on your behalf and mine. It wasn't a tragedy, it was an achievement. And there's all kinds of anticipatory symbolisms, uh, the leaven, the knot of bone broken, and so forth. Uh, we won't try to develop that all here. But even the timing, you'll discover the timing of the, our new beginning in Christ is on the anniversary of, our, of Noah's new beginning on the planet Earth. And you begin, as you study the scripture, you quickly discover that every detail there is an elegant tapestry by design. And Christ's crucifixion being the capstone of all of this. But moving on. Now the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to... That's a term they use collectively for that group of, of feasts that we're dealing with. Saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to such a man, and say unto him, The master saith, My time is at hand, I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. All this sounds, echoes, if you will, prearrangements. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready for the Passover. And when even was come, they sat down with the twelve, and as they did it, he said, Verily I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Get the picture. Judas wasn't planning it. Suddenly, he's on the spot. And they were exceedingly sorrowful, and began every one of them to say unto them, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. He identifies Judas. Judas has got a problem. He's got a fish or gut bait, as we would say. If he's going to do it, he's got to do it right now, because the word is out. So he's got to split and make arrangements that they had not anticipated. 
And Jesus goes on. He says, The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? And he said, You said it. Thou hast said. In fact, one of the other records says, He said, What thou doest, do quickly. Who's in charge here? So they had not planned to take him on a feast day for fear of the Romans. We just saw that in Matthew 26, verse 5. And this is the biggest feast day of the year. Over a million inhabitants visiting this. The Romans are nervous because they don't want it up. They don't care what happens as long as it's peaceful. An uproar is, what the, is the way their report card was measured. This time he was controlled by Jesus Christ. He put Judas on the spot. And Judas had... Arrangements to make. He had a split because he had to get to the high priest, make sure he was available. They had to muster the troops for the arrest. They had a schedule. You can't just go to Pilate. They had to make arrangements, political arrangements, to have a, a meeting with Pilate for reasons I'll explain shortly. And even at the Gethsemane, during the arrest, you'll notice Jesus is calling the shots. You're seek, seeking me, let these go their way. He's giving the orders. It's interesting to recognize who's really in charge here. Moving on to Matthew 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And instituting what we all recognize is communion. That bread and wine wasn't an afterthought. That was what Melchizedek offered Abraham back in Genesis 14. That was Joseph's dream, if you recall. Remember the wine steward and the baker? And uh, those, those prophecies back in Genesis 40 echo what's coming here in advance. And the bread of life discourse that Jesus gave back in John 6. The wine at Cana at, uh, in John 2. And uh, in Exodus chapter 6, when God, God is giving his command to Moses, he says, Wherefore say unto the, unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord. And I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rid you out of their bondage. I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. And I will take you to me for a people. And I will be to you a God. And ye shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. This is what's leading up to the institution of Passover in the first place. And because of these commands in the Torah, I'll bring you out. I will rid you of the bandage. I'll redeem you. And I'll take you. This gives labels to four cups that are used in Passover. In any Jewish home that does a formal Passover, there are four cups, and those cups have names. They have labels. They have a role. And it's interesting that we know from the Scripture that Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper with a third of those four. And I will redeem you. He doesn't finish because he's not going to touch the fourth cup until we're all together with him. Very interesting. It, 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 there's an unfinished cup to be shared, and that is, uh, that's part of the program here. We're not going to take the time to go into John's account of all of this, but John, from 13 to 18, has what we call the upper room discourse. And you want to study that in the context of that evening, because John gives us insights the others don't. And one of the things that in that discourse you don't want to miss is the announcement of what we call the rapture, or the harpazo in the Greek. Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Notice that, uh, and he goes on, if my, uh, he has you, you, you. Uh, it's, it, it's personal. And it's directed to you and I. You and me. Each of us. Okay, blessed hope. There are many mansions. He's preparing a place for us. He'll return for us where we will be where he is forever. That's the promise. These are very precious promises. I couldn't just gloss over even this quick summary. I couldn't gloss over that. He will return for us, the harpazo. He will snatch us out form forcibly. Paul details this in uh, First Thessalonians 4 and uh, 1 Corinthians 15. We'll look at, we'll look at those, one of those later. The phrase come again is used four times. At the rapture, spiritual presence, indwelling the believer, post-resurrection ministry. All alluded to in John 14. Worth your careful study. And there's a new thing he's announcing here. That there's going to be a man in heaven. 
Jesus became a man forever. He's not just a man for 33 and a half years. He, there's a man sitting on the throne of God as we speak. The redemption of the purchased possession in heaven by letter, better sacrifices are ex, expressed in, in Hebrews 9, Ephesians 1, and Colossians 1, and elsewhere. Let's move on. In Matthew 26, then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and two of the sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. In fact, it's Dr. Luke that tells us he was so heavy, he actually sweated blood. That's not a layman's term, that's a doctor's term. There's a medical term for that. But anyway, then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Cometh unto his disciples, find them asleep. Say then, Peter, what? Could ye not watch with me one hour? It's interesting, they could not watch for one hour. The adversaries are up all night in the trials. Anyway, watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again a second time and prayed, saying, O oh my father, if this cup may, may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. He's going to do that three times. And that's an important thing to understand. If it was any other way for you and I to enter heaven, that prayer wasn't answered. There's no other way. He came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy, and he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Three times. He asked to get off the hook. If there's any other way this could be accomplished. No, that's his mission. That's what he was committed to. Then cometh, he to. then cometh he to his disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let's be going. He is at hand that doth betray me. And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and the elders of the people. So they've gotten their act together, presumably. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he. Hold him fast. Forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. Nor said say, Lord. But anyway. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew a sword and struck a servant of the high priests and smote off his ear. We know that's Peter. We even know the guy's name, but that's from other, the other gospel accounts. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword in its place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? Jesus is going willingly, is the point. That's his mission. How then shall the scriptures be fulfilled, that thus it must be? And at that same hour said Jesus to the multitude, ye, Are ye come out against a thief with swords and staves for to take me? I sat daily with you, teaching in the temple, and ye laid no hold on me. But all this was done, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. And they that laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him afar off unto the high priest's palace and went in and sat with the servants to see the end. And now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At last came two false witnesses and said, The fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witnesses against thee? But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said to him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou shalt tell us whether thou be Christ, the Son of God. So he's under oath. And the oath itself is recorded elsewhere in detail. This is the formal oath that was challenged with. I adjure thee by the living God in whose office I stand, under whose power we all are, before whom thou standest, who knowest the truth and judgest between us and thee, that thou tell us this holy Sanhedrin, now here as before God, the truth. And so he was required by law to respond, Leviticus 5, 1 and 1 Kings 22 and elsewhere. So Jesus said, you said it, buddy. And he said, Jesus said unto him, thou hast said, nevertheless, I say unto you, hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, coming in the clouds.